Hi guys, welcome to The Finance Show with Joe. My name is Joseph Dalwood. I'm an economist, I'm a mathematician, and I am the founder of It's Simple Finance. It's Simple was founded on the basis of one thing, to make finance simple. And no one has done this better, she's even done it better than me, than my guest today, Queenie. Queenie, thank you so much for joining us on our podcast, and we are so excited to have you on today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat all things property. I think it's it's honestly there, I think there are a lot of opportunities, especially for first home buyers and people that haven't gotten into the property market yet, which I would love to discuss on this podcast. And I'm just really excited. I'm, I'm super excited to have Queenie on because Queenie was somewhat the inspiration of us creating this content at It's Simple. She was the one person I was watching on TikTok back in 2020. She was the person that I was watching on YouTube and she was just providing all these insight, all these tips to first home buyers. So to have you on, like, it's a fangirl moment for me. Like, ah, you know? Oh, yay, I'm so glad. So before I get you to answer anything, Queenie, the advice on this channel is... General advice only. It does not constitute personal financial advice. So it is really, really important that you remember this before you make any financial decisions. Give me some insight before we get into property, before we get into the first home buyers. How did you get your start with Invest with Queenie? Yeah, you know, it's it's super interesting because I guess when I start to think about where, where did my money journey really begin? And I think for a lot of us, it kind of actually begins back in childhood, you know, and a lot of us do have a lot of like money stories and money lessons that we learn growing up, some positive maybe some not so positive. Uh, but the one thing that that really, I think, shaped my money journey was actually my dad. So I grew up in a single parent household. So my dad raised me as a full-time stay-at-home dad. And it was always weird for me going to school. And like people would be like, oh, what do your parents do? What do your parents do? And I'm like, my dad doesn't do anything. Like he oh. actually doesn't have a job. And then it was interesting because like he actually had investments and passive income to pay for our lifestyle. And also, like, I think when people think that, they think like, oh my God, crazy lifestyle, going to Europe, European holidays, like crazy. It was like a very basic lifestyle. You know, we lived in like a, I'd say like middle class area. Um, I went to public schools. We didn't go on holidays. We didn't really even go to the movies and things like that. But he had enough passive income to pay for, I guess, like school fees and books and um, food and the necessities. It still, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. It, and it was like pretty amazing. So I guess that was like a lesson for me that I was like, wow, like people can actually earn money by not having a job mm -hmm. through investments. That's correct. And that's where it kind of started. And when did you end up finding your niche in the social media content space, the social area? Because this is, you know, you, you've you got, is it 120,000 followers on TikTok now? It's, you know, your pages are have exploded. Like people adore you. So when did you really notice that people needed this advice and they needed it to be simplified for them so that they could, you know, take advantage of what's in the market at the moment? I think that it was honestly during the period of the pandemic. And I think we all, that was like a really difficult period for a lot of people. And I just felt so grateful to be in the position that I was during the pandemic because I was young. I, I moved out of home when I was 19 and was not making much money at all. Like just literally like living week to week, you know, I was, I didn't, wasn't earning much money. I was spending pretty much everything that I made on Sydney rent and expensive groceries. Mm -hmm. And it was just like this cycle and I, I never thought I would get out of it. And I was, I just felt so grateful to be in a position a couple of years later to have actually bought a property, to have investments. And, you know, even though I wasn't financially free yet, um, I just felt like, wow, how lucky am I that even if I lost my job during the pandemic, I would still be okay. And I just knew that maybe Queenie, a few years before that, she wouldn't have been okay. Like mm -hmm. if she was living week to week, working in retail, you know, not making much money, like she, if she lost her job, she would be feeling bad about herself. She would think, you know, I suck. That's why this has happened. And I just wanted to create content to be like, no, you know, like it's, it's okay if you're not in the best financial position now, because I wasn't in a good financial position when I moved out of home and was living week to week. I had a negative net worth. I had more student loans than what I had in the bank account, which was not much money. And, you know, I think that if there are so many ways that you can get yourself 
out of a bad financial situation and into a good one. So I just wanted to share to give people hope. That's absolutely amazing. Could you give us one small tip for first home buyers, okay? What would it be? Ooh, okay. So I feel like there, there are so many that I would like to share. Maybe I, I can condense it though. I'll be quick. Yeah. Um, so there are heaps of first home buyer initiatives that I didn't know about when I bought my first home in 2019 and wasn't like crazy property. It was like, it was an apartment, two bedroom. The door handles were falling off the hinges in the cupboard. The oven didn't work. It's, you know, very old like apartment block. So it was not One of definitely the red, a dream home. A red brick <laughs> yeah, kind exactly. of apartment. Yeah, yeah. I know not, what you're talking about. Not like super glamorous, but it's a stepping stone. It's a start. And so I think, yeah, start where you are. There are affordable properties if you do look outside the glamorous areas, the glamorous properties, and you can also renovate it over time to increase the value. And there are heaps of first home buyer initiatives that I didn't know about. Like there's the first home buyer super saver scheme, which I didn't know about at the time, but if I knew about it, definitely I would look into that more. Another one, which is really good to look at is the first home loan, um, the first home guarantee. Yeah. So you can buy a place with a 5% deposit without paying for lenders mortgage insurance. So that can help people get into the property market earlier. I thought that you needed a 20%, but mm -hmm. now I know that you can actually get in earlier with a 5% with no LMI. And um, yeah, that there's also some other ones for single parents, but it's, it's really cool. It's amazing how often I get someone approaching me and they're like, hey, I want to buy my first home. I've got a $60,000 deposit. Is that enough? And I'm like, that is more than enough to buy your first home. I remember when I purchased my first property, I'm a little bit older than you. I was 22 years old. So this is 10 years ago. And none of these schemes were available. Absolutely none of them were available. And, you know, but property prices weren't as high as they were back then. And I was looking at areas, okay, where could I buy get an investment that will cover the rent. I had $15,000 saved up. Where did I go? I went to Tasmania and I bought something, 10% deposit, got an investment and I paid the stamp duty as well on top of that. And the stamp duty on $150,000 property wasn't that much at the time. I think it was, I think it was sub $10,000 if I can remember correctly. And what ended up happening was uh, that property grew in equity. It went from 150,000 to 320,000 by 2016. So in three years time, that amount of growth, I was able to now draw out of that property and then go and be able to purchase another investment and then continue rolling it over. And a lot of first home buyers, and I'm assuming a lot of your friends have asked you this in the past or people in your DMs, they're like, but property's too expensive. And it's like, it isn't if you know how to use it correctly. Would you agree with me on that? Yeah, I agree. And I think that one of the things that, I think is disheartening is when you look at places where you want to live or the really nice properties and you're like, yeah, those places are expensive. But if you just look outside, like maybe those areas, maybe they're, they're not trendy yet, but they could be. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's where you can have real value. Like for example, I, I feel like there are so many areas, especially in Sydney, where maybe a couple of years ago, it, they weren't as trendy as they are now and they, they weren't as convenient as they are now. And I think that you kind of need to think about that long-term lens, like property is a long-term game. It might not be cool now to live there, might not be trendy or convenient, but have a look in the future. Like, are there new train lines being built there? Are there new facilities that, that are being built there that could increase the price of the property? And yeah, I think it's a good way for first-time buyers to get into the market. I, yeah. I've got one of my clients, I, I never forget this story, Purchased with FHLDS in 2020, house and land package in Bardia. I don't know if you know where Bardia is, closer towards Campbelltown. I love Campbelltown, by the way. That whole area, the way it's getting all done up, favorite thing in the world. But that property, they purchased it for 600000 It's now worth a million. Wow. It's grown by, you know, 40% in because they purchased the house and land package end of 2019. It's grown by like 40% or something along the lines of that. And there are still these areas popping up if you know where to look. For example, um, Austral or anywhere near the new airport. They had so many redevelopments there that people took advantage of one or two years ago. You always have to kind of look. Don't trust the media, the news. That's my number one thing. And don't just go for, oh, property's too expensive. I'm not even going to bother. If you look hard enough, well, it's not even looking hard enough. If you spend time researching for month, 
let's say, you will find something. Would you agree? Totally agree. Totally agree. And those areas are so nice. You know, like yeah, going to the West, I'm like, this is so nice. They like redeveloped. They're main, main, like amazing facilities, great food places. It's like, you know, don't believe the stigma that, mm -hmm. you know, some places have. It's awesome. What trends have you noticed in the last 12 months? We've seen interest rates go up, I think, 12 times. We had two pauses in the last 14 months or so. What are the biggest trends that you have noticed? I've noticed that property prices aren't increasing as much because of the interest rate rises, which I think gives people an opportunity, especially first home buyers, to get into the market when it isn't so hot. It isn't, you know, sky high like it used to be and potentially more opportunities to even negotiate a bit more in a buyer's market. And I think especially now, because the rental market is so crazy right now, you know, like the, the rent that people are paying it's definitely worth considering, considering like how much are you paying in rent every week? And could you actually buy a property with that same money that you're paying in rent, something, an asset that you'll own later? And, you know, you could, I guess that there are a bit of arguments whether like buying a place to live in is an asset or not, but regardless, like putting your money towards something that you will later own, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's definitely worth considering. I've seen first home buyers that were helping purchase apartments in Villawood uh, that were $400,000 at the time, and this was 2021. Those properties grow to $600,000. What a lot of individuals don't know is the way that you could tap into that equity and then purchase another investment property afterwards. And I think you saying, hey, just get in the market, get in the market. It's a buyer's market. Now's the time you can renegotiate. I think that's a massive thing because two years ago, there was all this FOMO around purchasing. It was interest rates were so low. Money was basically free as they like to call it. It was 1.89%, but the repayments weren't anywhere near as what they are now. So we saw 80 people at open homes, 80 groups, and then no one at the rental market. On the other side of it now, there's 80 people at the rent, rental, there's 80 people at the rental open homes, and then there's 10 people at the purchase market. So now is the time to really take advantage Take advantage of the 5% scheme. Take, take advantage of, you know, let's say you're not applicable for that. Maybe approach Bluestone who do 10% 10 10 deposits with no lender's mortgage insurance. And if you want to use it as an investment property, because those are the things that you really need to start looking towards to get ahead because interest rates are up high now. But when they start coming down again, you and I both know property is always hot in Australia. Would you agree? I guess, yeah, it, over the long term, like it does perform really well, you know, and, and especially even just if you're looking for a place to live. I think that, I mean, I guess it, it all depends on the person, but I personally like having the feeling of like, you know, knowing that, that you own the place that you live in and it's just nice to know that it's contributing to, towards something. And you always have the option to like, you know, like you said, take equity out, move somewhere else, sell the place. Um, get something else. It's just, yeah, I think it's a it's a nice feeling. And there are affordable options. In your social media content, your financial strategies, I've seen you discuss shares before and potentially purchasing. To get a leg up, let's say you've got a hundred, you've got five hundred dollars, you've got a thousand dollars. What advice would you give to a first home buyer who just wants to get a little bit more ahead every single week? Let's say it's an extra twenty dollars a week or an extra fifty dollars a week. Where would you put that? Let's say when it comes to shares, are we looking at blue chip? Are we looking at, you know, possible uh, unstable shares? Give me some give me some insight into this as well. I think if I was going back and let's say I'm just moved out of home, I don't have a lot of money, I have maybe only a bit left over every week. Um, what I would look at is looking at the first home buyer super saver scheme. Like I know it's a bit complicated to wrap your head around. It's, it's honestly a bit of a complicated scheme, but I think it's pretty amazing. Like there's this calculator that you can do and it actually does the numbers for you. So if you ask your employer to contribute an extra, um, I think in the figures they did $7,000 a year, it reduces your take home pay by about $4,000. 
But because you're paying less tax into your super, you actually net out ahead than a high interest savings account. And it's super interesting. So just take a look at the, the numbers, like plug in a few numbers so and then you can see. The first home super saver scheme, I've seen it before. Like if it's $7,000, you're getting taxed at 15%. Yeah. So that's $1,050. If you're taking home that money, you're not going to get taxed at 1050 You're probably going to be taxed at 2100 for example. There's potential for that. So instead of you putting, you know, 6000 towards your deposit, you're putting 4900 if you elect not to use a first home super saver scheme. My advice always to first home buyers is actually, oh, have you got your deposit saved? No. Okay. Look at the first home super saver scheme because you can purchase an apartment with a $28,000 de deposit and you can get that in three years if you contribute enough to your super. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty amazing. And, you know, also another side note is that it's only the extra salary contributions. You can't take out any of your employer's mandatory contributions, but it's honestly amazing. When you plug in the numbers, like it does add up to quite a lot because especially something, it's just really interesting because obviously if you save in a high interest savings account, that also that money also is taxed, like whatever you make on your interest. Whereas the first home buy super saver schemes, like there are heaps of tax credits. So just plug in the numbers in a calculator and um, yeah, it's really interesting to see. I think it's one of the best schemes that the government's ever come out with. And they don't advertise it enough. They don't, nobody knows how to actually use it. And it's such a disheartening thing. They think, oh, it's too complicated. I won't touch it. But in reality, if you do this correctly, and my favorite thing about superannuation is you can't touch it. It's like, no, naughty, <laughs> you know, like you're not actually allowed to go in there unless you're under serious financial duress. And it allows you to really build up that savings deposit. How many times have you seen, for example, clients of yours or individuals that you know say, I can't save, why can't you save? Oh, you know, I always see something I want to buy. And then this is like a hands-off kind of thing with the superannuation. Yeah, it's like for savings because you it your employer immediately puts it into there, which saves for your deposit. So yeah, it's pretty amazing. And I think it's I think the reason why it's probably not known as well is because it's a bit complicated to do all the numbers. But mm -hmm. if you check out the calculators, like they do all the numbers for you. Could you give us so, some cool. insight where we can find these calculators? Oh, okay. I can't remember off the top of my head, but maybe we can put it in the show notes. Yeah. I can send you a link. We can add it in the links afterwards. Give me some insight for the future of the market. Where do you see Australia performing next? Are we still going to be bullish on property or are we going to be seeing more shares come about and people investing on that side? Because we've seen people get a bit scared of property because they think it's too expensive. Do you think as the government has changed the rules for the first time guarantee, the market's still going to accelerate? Do you think that you know we're going to see more people purchasing investments? Where do you see it going? Ooh, I think that diversification is always key for me. Like I, I do like to have property, but I also like shares and um, also having cash savings just in case an emergency pops up. So I do like the diversification. What's interesting with property though is I think there are some really interesting stats on immigration. So the Australian government has let in a lot more new immigrants and new migrants to Australia. So I feel like that could only really help our economy and especially like property prices. So I feel like in the future, it's property is always going to be expensive, you know, like I feel like nowadays we look at property prices and we think, oh my gosh, it's so expensive. But then I feel like that's probably what people thought 10 years ago, looking at their property prices. And it's kind of like, I feel like it's always going to be expensive. And I think the key is just find a way to do it smartly, buy what you can afford. Also just try not to, um, I guess interest rates, you, you don't know where they will be in the next couple of years. So it's always good to have a buffer of what you can afford. You know, um, when I bought my first place, it was for $500,000. And I'm, I, I realize now I probably could have borrowed more, mm -hmm. but I'm glad that I didn't because now my mortgage, it, it's not that, that much of a stretch for me to pay it off. So I think it's also good to look at like what what could the interest rates look like in a couple of years and can you still afford that place? That's one thing that I always see you preaching, live within your means. You know, we've had so many afterpay and I think the other one is called zip pay and Affirm. There's all these different apps and programs that you can use, lines of credit and stuff. And I, I, I don't even know how afterpay works. I just never had opened one. Like I, I genuinely don't, but you're always telling people, hey, you know, maybe afterpay isn't a good idea or maybe zip pay isn't a good idea. Why is that? I think that it's 
It's essentially the the psychology of it. It makes it seem more affordable than it really is. You know, like if you break it down into small monthly repayments, you think it's more affordable. And I have friends that have gotten into that trap of thinking like, oh, it's okay. It's only $9 per week for four weeks. And then they forget about the other $9 that they spent last week and the $24 they spent the week before. And it, it becomes this cycle. And I think that it, it is really important to consider because all these little things, they really do add up. And I think one thing that, that really helped me was like looking through my expenses every month. And it is a bit disheartening because the first time you do it, it you it, you just feel this overwhelming sense of guilt, like, oh my gosh, all those little tiny little expenses that I didn't think matter actually add up to a huge amount at the end of the day. So I would say looking at those little expenses and trying to like limit the waste. Or I'm not saying like don't spend money on things that you love and things that you enjoy and things you value, but just the things that you don't value, the things that you don't remember, that you don't even use, that you bought, maybe try to find ways that you can, yeah, save that money instead. And like you said, live below your means. My my tip often to a lot of individuals is to open two bank accounts that don't talk to each other and put money aside for spending. You're allowed to spend, you're a human being. You're allowed to enjoy your life. Go out, go have coffee, go have some, you know, go eat lunch, anything along the lines of that. But you put, let's say, 200 bucks a week. Okay, let's say you're earning $1,000 salary a week, whatever it is. 200, 150 bucks a week. That's your spending money in one bank account. Make sure it doesn't talk to this bank account. And then that way, you've transferred all your money over to you, your $150 a week. That's your set budget. That's what you're going to spend. And then everything else is your savings. With that $150, if that goes empty, okay, and there's something you really want to buy, you really want to buy it, you make sure you... You, well, no, you don't make sure, but you can transfer it from this account to that account, but make sure it takes 24 hours for it to hit that account. Because in that 24 hours, you'll go to yourself, you know what, I really don't need that t-shirt. Or why am I spending $80 on a bum bag? Or why am I spending another $200 on sneakers when I've got five pairs of sneakers at home? That's my favorite thing to say to people rather than telling them, no, just go open an afterpay account. And us as mortgage brokers, we now have to include buy now, pay later in our serviceability calculations. So they will look at people's afterpay statements and they go, okay, this is $200 a month. That's going to affect their servicing. And $200 a month can mean thousands of dollars less on your borrowing capacity. So you could lose out at an auction or you can lose out on buying an apartment because you decided, oh, I want to buy a couple of t-shirts instead kind of thing. You know, so it's actually insane how much that works. Oh, it's so true. I, I, that reminds me of this video that I saw. It was really interesting. But basically one way to look at it if you want to buy something is let's say you have a T-shirt and the T-shirt is $30. Imagine in that situation someone comes up to you and they have the T-shirt in one hand and they have $30 in another hand and they're like, which one would you prefer? And you know, which one would you choose in that situation? Would you choose the $30 or would you choose the t-shirt? And that's a good way to think like, do I actually need this or not? Or would I actually choose the t-shirt over money in that situation? So yeah, it's, it's a good way to think about it. I actually really like that because money is so electronic these days that we're just like, oh yeah, I can afford that. You don't actually sit there and look at the cash and look at the item in your hand. Would I rather have four $20 bills or would I rather have a new shirt, new button up shirt from industry. Let's say, for example, I'm going to get murdered or cancelled by industry. Um, but that's what we could have. And then when you look at it and you go, oh my God, no, I, I might actually take the four $20 because I know I've got 13 nieces and nephews, big Lebanese family. I can give each one of them a present. I could say, hey, go get yourself some McDonald's or go get yourself, you know, something to eat or something along the lines of that. You know, I, know, I actually really like that. I'm going to start using that one moving forward. Yeah. Would you be able to tell us, pivoting? The future of the Australian market, do you think we're going to be recession proof? Because we've seen inflation at all time highs. We're now seeing a lot of people come off their fixed rates. Are we going to be able to withhold? Are we going to be able to withstand? And if so, what advice can you give to Australians or what advice can you give to people to make themselves a little bit more recession proof? Yeah, it's a really good point. I, I would say that one thing that 
has really is really helpful is having an emergency fund. So that's three to six months of living expenses saved in a bank account that you can access at any time. So we've seen now with the tech layoffs and a lot of people losing their jobs, having some money in your bank account to rely on is just really, really helpful so that you know you don't have to, you know, take out a line of credit or you don't have to do anything drastic. So that's the first thing I would say. Another thing I would say is um, we really just don't know the future of like any country or how any country will perform long term. So that's why I think it's important to diversify. And what I personally do is I do like to buy um, global index funds and global ETFs. So I'm not just investing in one tiny country that is 2% of the world's uh, GDP. I'm investing in basically like the whole world stock market. So mm. I think diversif just diversification is key. So different types of assets to build up your portfolio and also having an emergency fund and a buffer so that you know, just in case something happens, you have some money that you can rely on if you need to see a family member, you know, and you need to take some time off work. It's, it's just nice knowing that you have that buffer. I, the I always like to keep that six month fund because I always forget about my car rojo and I always forget about my insurances. Okay. I, I do. It's just, it's just a normal thing. And it's always, my car is registered for January 4th. So what am I thinking of before then? I'm thinking about Christmas presents. I'm thinking about New Year's Eve. I'm thinking about everything but paying for my car rojo. And then all of a sudden I get paid. How, how much is it these days? A blue slip or what? It, you know, whatever it's called. It's like a thousand bucks. By the time you finished everything, it's like eighteen hundred dollars. You got to make sure that you have that money aside. Would you agree? Oh yeah, totally. And then if you don't have that money, that's when you know it can get dangerous. Where yeah. you you know put it on a credit card or something like that to deal with later. But it's like and then yeah. it's twenty two percent interest. And people always love the points that come with the credit card. They're like, but I'm getting points. But I'm getting points. But I'm getting points. But if you look at the actual amount of points for a flight. You can't get a good flight with Qantas for under 250,000 points. That means that flying with Qantas, you have to spend $250,000 on your credit card before you can even look at a flight with Qantas. And that's just too much money to be spending on a credit card. That's all right. I would disagree with you there. Really? Because I love points. I love, okay. But I also do like to calculate, is it worth it or not? So for example, some places like the ATO, you can pay your credit card you can pay with your credit card, your okay. tax bill, but they do charge fees where it's not worth it. Um, but one place where it, it is worth it is um, things like groceries, but I always pay it back in full and on time so I don't okay. pay interest and you don't get charged any fees. And also they have these like bonus point signups. So if you can get 100,000 points just by signing up and, you know, doing your daily expenses. So, so but where have you – what what point system do you think is – a good one for people to be used or which, which one have you used personally um, to take advantage of this? Because I've seen on my end, I, I don't use points as often anymore because I just, I, I realize oh, I can't even get anything with them. So what do you think? I would say, well, Quant I use Qantas Frequent Flyer, but mm. instead of getting like just any flights, because some of those flights, there are some flights that are more worth it than others. So I only book the classic reward seats. Mm -hmm. So let's say you, you, I booked a flight to the Philippines it costs me 55,000 points economy one way or 75,000 points business class. There are some of those flights, the exact same flight, that could cost you 300,000 points. So it's important to like look at the classic reward seats just so, to make sure you're like... So I'm yeah. just looking at the wrong seats. Yeah. Okay, classic that makes sense. Classic reward seats. They're, they're honestly a game changer. So how can I... Is there a way for me to look at like the classic reward seats? Because now this is a game changer for me. This is making me want to use these systems. Is there a way for me to be able to find it? Yeah, yeah. So you can, add, there's like a little um, toggle that you can switch on. And if you just click on classic reward seats, it only shows you the cheap, cheap classic reward seats. Okay. And yeah, the other one's like definitely not worth it. Like 300,000 points for like a short flight, not yeah. worth it. But yeah, if you use the classic reward seats, you can get some flights for under 50,000 points. Okay. Yeah. That's a little bit more reasonable. Okay. So to be able to manage this point system. We never want people to spend beyond their means. Can you give some advice to individuals? You, you touched on it a little bit. I use, I spend my groceries, I get my points, but I pay it back immediately. Could you give some insight as to, okay, this is how you manage a point system so that you're never spending beyond your means? Yeah, I always pay back everything that I owe in full, on time, everything, because I think the credit card companies are a bit tricky. 
they'll send you a statement and they'll say, minimum balance that you need to pay, $33. And you're like, sweet, I just need to pay 33 bucks. No, that's that's where you get you get caught. So I think it's important to pay back every single thing that you owe. So then you don't pay interest, you don't get caught in that cycle. And I guess just be honest with yourself because I know for me, I'm somebody that uh, I check my credit card statements regularly. I make sure that I'm not overspending and buying things that I wouldn't normally buy. But I also know that not everybody is going to to do that. So I guess just be honest with yourself. Like. If you're savvy with your credit card and you know you're going to pay it off, you know that you're not going to overspend, it might be worth looking into. It could be worth it. But if you're not going to do that, then it's definitely not for you. So, yeah, I guess just knowing yourself. I think that's the best thing. And I think a bit of self-discipline is the number one thing to for individuals to take on. I want financial freedom. How do I get financial freedom? Through discipline the routine. I know for a fact my gym membership comes out on this Friday, it's going to be $24. Okay. That's the $24 I put aside for that. I know for a fact that this t-shirt costs too much money. I'm not going to go spend money on that t-shirt. I know for a fact that, hey, I went out and ate a $100 dinner last week with my partner. I'm not going to do that again this week because if I do, we're not going to be able to buy that dream property. So I think it's a little bit of discipline and Finding the adventure within the cheaper things. So let's say you have to make dinner at home. Yes, it is a little bit more tedious. Make it a romantic date, get some candles, okay? You can have the best dinner for like 30 bucks at home and then then your partner will turn around and say, oh my God, look at this nice thing they did for me. We didn't have to go out, nothing. We did this. And then we sat down on the couch and we drank some wine. And that's that's kind of what me and my partner do. Okay, we oh, so that's where I got the idea from. We do a once a week thing and we go, okay, let's have date night at home where we, you know, cook for cook for each other and then we'll open a bottle of wine and then we'll watch a movie. And I think that's what's really helped us get ahead as well. Oh, I love that. Do you have any favorite meals that you make? I think last night's was pretty good. Uh, she made a barramundi with like a quinoa and pineapple with uh, sweet potato chunks in it and all that kind of stuff. So we're, we're also big health freaks because you know, big gym goers and everything along the lines of that. So yes, uh, to a lot of people that might not sound like a romantic night, but for me, that's a special night. Oh, I love it so much. That's Queenie, so nice. I want to thank you so much for jumping on the show with us. Where can people find you? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Uh, I also have a podcast as well. And uh, I also have, if it's okay, I have like a free first home buyer's guide. And some of the schemes that we mentioned in this podcast are all included on there. So there are about five different schemes available. So you can have a look at them, see which one works for you. And yeah, it's completely free. We'll link it in the show notes. So where can our listeners find you and where can they download a copy of this guide? You can find me as Invest with Queedy on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and I also have a podcast as well. Same name, Invest with Queenie, and we've linked the free first home buyer's guide in the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on. As always, my name is Joseph Dalwood. If you need any help with your home loan, you can visit us at www.itsimple.com.au. You can also reach out to us at It's Simple Finance on Instagram and LinkedIn. As always, thank you for trusting us with your vision in finance.